thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to share my experience with you today. It's a pleasure to return to uh, UK Connections again this year. Um, I'll start with a disclosure that I'm a, a newcomer to the gaming community. I'm not a war gamer. Um, I'm an analyst. Um, I'm an analyst who's interested in, in doing rigorous analysis and um, to help solve important problems and, and uh, which are on the interface of science and security. Uh, so tomorrow we're actually running a workshop uh, on the tasking of three uh, strategic level missile defense um, and nuclear deterrence gaming events. Um, and in this workshop we'll be seeking input from, from UK officials and NATO officials uh, and, our, and our project advisors to try to figure out what is, uh, what is the most interesting, relevant, and analytically challenging question uh, that we can gain. <coughs> Uh, so these games are, uh, they constitute the experimental component of a two-year study that examines how missile defense uh, will affect nuclear deterrence and stability in the new strategic environment. Uh, so this is a study that's, that's sponsored by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, um, and it's led by the Center for Science and Security Studies here at King's, um, and I'm actually based in Stanford. So I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of the project, I'll explain why we chose gaming as a method of inquiry. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the process and how we convince uh, funders and, and government stakeholders that this is a worthwhile project. We must write a new playbook uh, to deter Russia's malign and stabilizing infamous coercion and aggression. So that, that's what uh, U.S. Secretary uh, Defense Ash Carter said um, last year said that we need a new playbook that better integrates conventional uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, so missile defense, uh, specifically the capability to defend against limited nuclear missile strikes, uh, that was that was uh, an important new addition to the United States and NATO's post-Cold War uh, nuclear terms playbook. And so that playbook is now outdated. So the question is, the role of missile defense change, um, and if so, how? <coughs> so, missile defense is, is a stabilizing element of national power, uh, and it's stabilizing because overall it will help reduce the risks uh, posed by 21st century uh, nuclear challengers, uh, countries like Iran and North Korea, who are equipped with nuclear missiles and nuclear blackmail strategies. So that's the core idea that's underpinned uh, the post Cold War Renaissance of missile defense technology, uh, and it's the idea that's at the core of, of the current U.S. Uh, and NATO missile defense posture. But this idea may no longer hold in the current environment. Uh, in the new environment, missile defense can increase some risks, uh, but decrease uh, others, and it could be stabilizing in one context and destabilizing in another. Um, it, it is, as uh, relations with major and minor nuclear powers change, um, and as, as allies and adversaries develop new capabilities, we need to carefully consider how, um, what are the factors, what are the mechanisms, um, and how this can affect the greater stability. Uh, so that's the focus of our present project, and so I'll, I'll give a brief overview of its objectives um, and activities, and, um, and then highlight, um, uh, talk about the, the why we chose working. Uh, so, so the project will challenge, it aims to challenge current strategic thinking on the relationship between missile defense and nuclear weapons. Um, our basic assumptions need to be reassessed, um, and this is a multinational uh, problem that is at a global scale. Uh, but, but we're only interested in the role of missile defense in uh, the changing relationship between the United States, NATO, and Russia. Um, so also in terms of scope, uh, our focus is on the risk of nuclear conflict. Um, missile defense has a nuclear and conventional, uh, conventional dimensions, but we're, we're interested in its effects on A new U.S. administration will uh, likely conduct a major review of missile defense policy next year. 
uh, discussions of, of um, uh, deterrence and defense posture review at, at NATO are are also on, on, on the underway, so there's, there's time to think, but um, there's also an opportunity to, to impose policy. And one way of doing that is, is to help shape the expert debate and, uh, and build points of agreement between U.S. stakeholders and, and NATO allies on what some of these, on how do we, how do we frame this issue? So this is uh, a two-year project. It includes five types of activities. We have uh, research, so that's data collection, um, analysis, the experimental phase starts in September uh, this month with um, three gaming events later this year and then during the first half of next year. Um, and then we'll conclude with reporting and um, dissemination, which will take place throughout the project. So uh, conducting evidence-based research on missile defense and, and nuclear crisis is very problematic. Uh, missile defense deployments are a relatively new development. Nuclear use is fortunately outside of human experience. Uh, so is it possible to get any empirical data? Um, and the answer is yes, it's possible. Um, and the project will be based entirely on unclassified open source data. Uh, so we have two types of materials that we use, um, published open source materials, but also interviews with, with US and um, European and Russian stakeholders. Um, and so we, we aim to discover um, how, how military planners and policymakers think about uh, each other's military capability. Uh, we'll also um, try to gather, uh, have a collection of scenarios, uh, of types of scenarios uh, of nuclear use and, and world missile defense and past crises. So for example, we have so there are a few because missile defense technology is only now being deployed, but um, for example, in 2008, during the Georgia crisis, we had Russian nuclear contingency planning um, against US Aegis ships in the Black Sea that were not nuclear capable then, but uh, they were not missile defense capable then, but, um, but are now. And so we'll combine qualitative analysis with uh, physical and mathematical pro uh, modeling. Uh, so we'll be modeling physical events where the principles of interaction are, are well known. But we'll be doing inductive sort of uh, bottom-up analysis of how people perceive these relationships. So our aim is to identify the key technical and political factors that influence how missile defense affects nuclear risks. Uh, <coughs> And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of what that might look like. Um, so the stabilizing or destabilizing role of missile defense uh, has been largely attributed to their anti-ballistic missile function. Uh, but missile defense assets that are currently deployed have at least five functions, air and missile defense, nuclear and conventional attack, and, and anti-satellite capability. Um, and so that's well understood by military planners, not so well um, incorporated by the analytical policy communities. And so that's, that's an example of one new factor that, that we need to explore. And so our approach is very different from um, the analytical approaches that were, that were used, um, that have been used during the Cold War and are still being reproduced today. Uh, so these new exchange models assume that the mechanisms of interaction are, are well known, uh, but nearly no one believes uh, today that a pull out of the blue and nuclear attack is likely. So, so you know, this kind of modeling is, is is really outdated. So we'll have three strategic level gaming events at the UK Defense Academy, or here uh, at King's College uh, 
Uh, and players will include former U.S. and European officials, and ideally also Russian former officials. Um, and, and getting Russian participation might be difficult um, in the current political environment, but um, getting people with deep understanding of, of Russian strategy and operations would be, uh, would be possible. So we don't yet know what problems the games should address and how and, and then how to design them uh, to produce useful insights. So this will be uh, the focus of the workshop tomorrow. Um, and the group will explore uh, what is the scoping question um, through three interrelated contexts. So we have the policy context, what are the what, are the, what decisions do policymakers need to make in the next two years? Um, the strategic and operational context, so what is the strategic and operational value um, of defenses? Um, and then technology and force structure, so what are some of the characteristics of weapon systems that might be relevant to, um, that might be interesting and relevant to, to, to the, the broad um, focus of the project? So, the focus really is to identify our knowledge gaps. And the experiments should, should produce insights that help inform the decisions on missile defense and nuclear policy that will be made in the next two years. Uh, and also that help help to do that, help us understand the strategic environment in the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, and then we'll have an afternoon session that, uh, that is really um, uh, a session that explores trade-offs in game design and uh, brainstorm scenarios. Um, and so we've got resources for um, three three-day gaming events and, and for professional gaming consultants to, to run these, these events. So, so this is the, the a general overview of the project and um, I've been asked to talk about why? Why did we choose board gaming? Um, so we didn't start with the question, what problems uh, could gaming help answer? Uh, we started with an important national security problem, um, a current policy problem, um, and this problem, policy problem is, is underpinned by um, a fundamental knowledge gap, a theoretical knowledge gap, uh, because we, we have very little empirical data on, on nuclear use and uh, missile defense technologies is a, is a new thing. We've also got technological change. We've got a changing political relationship with Russia. We've got renewed interest in um, in uh, options like limited nuclear use. Uh, and so we just don't have a good enough understanding of how missile defense affects incentives for nuclear use in, in its changing strategic environment. So we started with a policy problem um, and we have the best analytical tools uh, to help produce useful insights. And so gaming is, is one of these tools, uh, but it's, it's also part of, of a mixed methods approach. Uh, so, so why do I see uh, gaming as a useful method of inquiry? So, so these three games, they're not, um, they're not there to reliably test hypotheses. Um, they can't predict future crises. Uh, neither are they going to um, credibly point decision makers in the direction of, of the best way forward. Uh, and so I explained this to one of our project advisors, who's a, a former senior Pentagon official, and, and he said, wait, but why are you doing this? Um, uh, so, so to me, gaming in this project is, is useful where other forms of analysis fail. So in situations with highly uncertain analytical uh, outcomes, so for example, uh, Russian nuclear doctrine calls for limited nuclear strikes to de-escalate a conventional conflict. So would putting missile defense in that equation, would it take these sort of cheap shots off the table? Uh, or would it make them more likely uh, because the Russians would, would be seeking to demonstrate an intent and not actually uh, cost significant damage. So gaming can produce uh, useful 
quantitative insights into a, a crisis decision making process. Um, and it can also help serve as a, as a aid to, to thinking and, and further hypothesizing. Um, so we need to identify the, uh, the factors, the technological and human factors um, that affect the relationship between missile defense and nuclear risk. Um, and also, what are the mechanisms? And how, how, how is it that these factors work? <coughs> uh, the other value of gaming uh, here uh, is, would be the, essentially the social benefits of a track two or a track one point one effort. Um, so so it, having different participants together in the same room uh, will help create a shared understanding among them. And, and hopefully, we have Russia and NATO participants um, who create a shared understanding of the challenges uh, and the new requirements for strategic stability. Um, it's also a way of having a uh, gaming can be seen as a structured interview. So it's a way for eliciting expert input into an area where people have no actual expertise. So uh, how do we get people interested in the project um, and in using gaming? Uh, well, frankly, gaming was, was not a hard sell. Um, and the only person I had trouble convincing of the merits of board gaming has been Phil Saban. Um, and Phil is my advisor at King's, and uh, he's advising me against including gaming in my PhD thesis because it's a problematic method of inquiry. Uh, but We've, we've gotten uh, good support here at King's and when Bowen who heads um, our new school for uh, security studies, uh, he was eager to support the project and, and so now serves as its director. So the gaming was in the part itself. Um, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, our funder, they issued a call for proposals on new technologies and the future of deterrence. And so this was, this was a new initiative for them. Um, but Carnegie are one of the largest funders uh, for uh, nuclear security work in the non-governmental um, field. Um, and so they specifically said they, they see value in projects that could do tabletop exercises, some kind of scenario planning. Um, and so they, they consider that, that quite innovative. Uh, so there were, there were 50 proposals. So they were interested in gaming, but it wasn't easy to, to, uh, to get this because there were 50 proposals from European and U.S. research teams and, and only six, six of those got funded. Um, and I think the reason for, uh, for our success and, and the, the key in, in, um, in putting this together is identifying the policy need and the analytical need. Uh, gaming in itself as, as part of a mixed methods approach is, is very appealing. Um, so gaming was a hard sell. Uh, quantitative modeling, uh, specifically game theoretic modeling, that was a hard sell. We specifically said you should, you should drop that. We're not interested in quantitative modeling. Um, with regard to government stakeholders, we've gotten uh, quite a bit of engagement. Um, some are eager to provide input into the tasking and identify the right problem set. Uh, one UK agency has been concerned that the Experimentation could undermine existing policies, so they're they're still having to make a decision on whether they, they choose to they choose to participate. Uh, but overall, we've got a, a very engaged response on both the U.S. and NATO side, um, and frankly, on the Russian side as well. Although we've, we've so far had limited interactions there. So my experience is that policymakers and funders see gaming as an interesting and innovative approach. Uh, but also many aren't aware of its limitations. <coughs> so this is uh, it's work that's ongoing, and um, I would appreciate your uh, your reactions and insights, and uh, happy to talk a little.